Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Working with Adam. My name is Chris Santora. I'm a senior software engineer at Amazon Game Tech. And with me is Johnny Galloway, who's a senior design technologist. In this presentation, we're going to cover some common workflows in the Atom Renderer, especially around the material system. Starting in a digital content creation tool, or DCC, we'll set up a small scene with some basic models, some materials and lighting, add a script to drive some material changes dynamically, and we'll create a custom material type with vertex animation. This is the final scene that we're working towards. It has image-based lighting, it has area lights, it has a model with multiple materials on it. There's a script that makes the orb in the center oscillate, and a custom material type is making the grass look like it's blowing in the wind. As we go through our presentation, we'll demonstrate how all this was achieved through a series of pre-recorded videos. At this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Johnny, who's gonna get us started with some first steps in DCC. Hello. Uh, in this first segment, we're gonna cover working primarily with DCC tools. Um, getting started with Atom is pretty straightforward. You need a 3D modeling package that supports FBX file export. Uh, we've tested many, but we haven't tested them all. The O3D model platform, model pipeline flattens your model scenes. Um, there are other ways to work that are a little more complicated that we're not gonna go into today. And we're also work working on a new feature called procedural prefabs that will procedurally retain the scene hierarchy. Some materials from DCC tools are portable, which means they can be converted to Atom materials automatically. An example is Stingray PBS inside of Maya. Uh, and we'd like to support more of those sort of things in the future. What's important to understand for your 3D models is that we have a material called standard PBR. PBR stands for physically based rendering and it has its roots in, a, in a, some work from Disney that they presented in 2012. Our models support two UV sets. Those UV sets can be indexed or they can be namespaced. So here we're gonna jump into a pre-recorded video. Let's start building our monolith scene. Here I have opened a popular 3D modeling package. When I start a new project, I like to start with some scale reference. Here on the left, I have a one meter cube with some basic texturing and I have a 3D model of a human for scale reference. Here in the middle, I've created a very basic 3D model that represents our monolith with two materials applied. We can select our model and export it as an FBX file. I'm gonna call it monolith blockout. Now we can jump to the O3D editor. We can create a new level. I'm gonna call this monolith blockout. This provisions a simple default level in O3DE that has a skybox, some lighting, a ground plane, and a 3D model. We can customize this. Let's grab the entity called Shader Ball. Let's rename it Monolith. This entity has a mesh component and it's loading a 3D model asset for the Shader Ball. If we clear that reference, we can replace it with our blockout model. Here you'll see we've loaded the 3D model we exported. It retains the two materials that were applied, the sandy colored brown and the blue material on the sphere. If we add a material component, we can see those two materials individually applied with different uh, assignment slots. We can come back to this later. So we can customize this scene further. The first thing we want to do is grab the, the global sky entity. This has a global skylight, which loads IBL. IBL is image-based lighting. So this would be the lighting that's cast into the scene from the skybox. And then we have a skybox, which is the background image that's displayed behind the monolith. We have a custom skybox and lighting we can load. So let's do that. So we're going to open the asset picker. We have this evening horizon skybox with some clouds. It's generating three output images. The first one is a skybox. So when we pick that, we'll see the skybox change. And then we want to load the lighting that matches. So the first one is the diffuse lighting. The second one is the specular lighting. Now that change is currently pretty subtle. 
but this seems pretty bright. So let's take the energy levels down so we can take the exposure EV100 stops down by a negative two on both the skylight and the skybox. So now we have a slightly darker scene. So the next thing we can do is we can grab this entity called sun. Let's turn on debug rendering. We see four arrows up here. That's the direction that this directional light is casting light into the scene. If we take this entity and we rotate it, we can actually control the direction of the lighting and shadows that are cast into the scene. So let's do that here. We can also take this color swatch and we can customize that. So we're gonna pick, actually let's pick a blue value from the sky and then we'll switch to uh, HSV and we can brighten that up a bit. So now we have blue indirect lighting uh, and we've matched that with our sun energy. The next thing we can do is create a new entity. Let's call this Manny. And we're going to add a mesh component. And we're going to load our mannequin model from our DCC tool. And if we drag this out, we can see that we've retained the scale access, uh, the scale of the 3D models. So we have this uh, mannequin casting light onto this monolith. So the next thing we want to do, uh, let's see if we can emulate some fog. So if we create a new entity and we rename this fog, we can add a new component called deferred fog. That requires a post effect layer component that we're not going to cover today. Let's enable the deferred fog, enable fog layer. We're going to set the start distance to 10 meters. We're going to set the end distance to 60 meters. And we're going to set the fog bottom height to a minus one. And we're going to set the max height to 16. So that gives us this default fog that recedes into the distance. If we take this purple color swatch here, let's disable the deferred fog for a second. If we take this color swatch, we open it, we can pick this fog color from the horizon of the skybox itself. We in, in, re-enable this fog, it's a more seamless color. So we can actually tune this a little bit and try to get closer if we want or tweak the color a little bit, but this looks pretty good as a starting point. So that's it. That's all it takes to get something started, but we can go a little further. Let's grab this ground plane. This has a material component applied. We can take this material instance. Let's generate a, mater a source material. Now we have a source material applied and we can go into this uh, material instance editor. And from here, what we can do is we can use this swatch right here for base color. And we can make this a brown. And you'll see that the ground plane is being tinted the same brown color. So let's do this and modify it a little bit. And that's the beginnings of our base scene. So let's turn off debug rendering. So that's about it. That's all it takes to get started. In the next segment, we're going to detail this 3D model some more. We have one more segment. Um, the second segment primarily focuses on the O3D editor. We're gonna add some additional look development and polish to this scene. So we're gonna enhance the layout with some additional objects, create some better looking materials, and then work on the lighting a little bit. So let's jump into it. Hello, in this segment, we're gonna perform some additional look development, adding some additional lighting, post effects, and materials to the scene. So here we have a copy of our monolith scene and we're gonna start modifying it. So we'll jump back to the 3D modeling package. Here we have our block out monolith. I've sculpted some simple terrain. Let's go ahead and hide this block out. Um, so we have a fully modeled version of this monolith with full detail. So let's go ahead and take this new model and we'll export it as an FBX. And we're gonna call it 
uh, block out version two. And then let's go ahead and export this simple terrain model as an FBX as well. So we're going to call this ground plane dirt. And we're going to jump back to the o O3D editor. So uh, this is pretty straightforward. We can just grab our monolith and we're going to clear the 3D model asset that's there and we're going to change to our block out. So we see the, the new model up here with its uh, default materials. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is grab the ground plane and we're going to clear its model reference and we're going to switch to our ground plane dirt. So we see that fill in. Now we can start working on some materials. So if I jump to the material editor here, I have three materials that I uh, previously created. We have this kind of uh, red marble, red shiny marble. Uh, we're going to put on the sphere. We have this gold ore that we're going to apply to the body of the monolith. And we have this rocky uh, dirt that we are going to place on the ground plane. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So if, if we start with our monolith model, let's select it. Uh, we can use the material component to find and assign these. So we're just going to type in gold ore here, which is going to apply the body material. And we're going to search for marble. And we're going to apply that to the sphere. Uh, that looks pretty good. We're going to grab our ground plane. And we can look for our ground plane dirt material. Whoops. And that's pretty straightforward. So uh, this sphere is not glowing like we want it to. So if we jump back to the material editor, let me show you how we can set up an emissive material. So we'll grab the marble material. We're going to go down to the emissive section. We'll enable that. You'll see that it starts emitting more light. We have this kind of bright orange color. We can play with the intensity. Let's set this to six. So now we have this material that looks like it's glowing pretty good. So let's save that. And we can go back to the O3D editor and that updates. That looks pretty good. So now we can actually make this sphere cast light into the scene. So the way we would do that is we're going to create a new entity. We can call this light. We can add a light component. We can choose the type of light. We're going to pick a sphere light. We're going to turn on debug rendering. So this white cage in the back is represents how far this light is casting light into the scene. And we have another debug sphere. If we play with the radius here, we can see how large this light surface area is. So we've created a sphere light. We're just going to line this up with our, our sphere here. And we're going to go ahead and play with the, the color of this light. Let's turn off debug rendering. So we started to make that orange. We're going to, we don't need the de debug rendering anymore. So, uh, We've got this orange color set, and now we can just simply play with the intensity. Uh, let's switch this to EV. So we can you know, crank this up. It's going to cast a lot of light into the scene. And we can also just go ahead and simply enable shadows here. So now this spherical light is going to project shadows into the scene. And let's play with, with this a little bit. So that's the basics of adding some additional lighting to the scene. So I actually have a, a light here that's um, better tuned. The next thing we want to do is add some simple post effects. So I'm going to grab my camera entity. It's got a post effect layer here. So let's just go ahead and add a bloom component. And if we enable this bloom component, we can see that it begins to make the emissive effect of this material really kind of shine. And if, if we grab this intensity, you know, we can play with how much blooms applied. I think that that looks pretty good and is, is close to our, our final scene. So from here, uh, we're starting to get pretty close to our, our final image. Um, what I have here is some additional entities that we can add in the background. Uh, and I think this looks pretty good. And the last step would be to add the garden. So it's going to talk about um, vegetation. The, material system and modifying uh, a material to add some wind to the grass. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Before we get into the next segment, I'd like to give a bit of an overview of the material system. The most common unit of the material system is the dot material file. This provides all the property values to configure the appearance of a surface. 
and each one references a .material type file. This file provides the property layout and links to relevant shaders for the materials. Materials can also have a parent material, in which case it will inherit the material type and all the property values from the parent. It also provides overrides for some property values. Then at runtime, these assets can be used to create one or more material instances in memory. These will configure the actual draw packets that get sent to the renderer. By default, material components on multiple entities will share one material instance for that asset, but we can also create a unique material instance to make changes to just one entity. So now in this video, we'll see how to set up materials that inherit from each other, and this will share data and simplify updates in the future. Here we are in the material editor, ready to create materials to use on this grass model. Before we start, it would be great if we could use this model for the preview in the material editor so we can see exactly what we're doing. To do that, go view, viewport settings, click to add a new model settings file. We'll call it grass and save. Display name will also be grass and the model asset will be grass tile large. Once we have that selected, we need to click Save again to make sure that those settings are applied the next time we load the material editor. We can close this now. Let's create a new material. We're going to use Enhanced PBR because that supports subsurface scattering and transmission, which will look nice on grass. Let's put this in the objects folder next to the model that we're going to use it on since this material really is specific to this model. Before we start applying base color and roughness and other texture maps, I'd like to set up the subsurface scattering. Doing that before we set up the other maps will make it easier to see what's going on. It will also be easier to see subsurface scattering and transmission if we switch to a different lighting setup, like this one, that has a stronger directional light. Let's turn on subsurface scattering and change the color to green. We'll select thin object transmission as that's most appropriate for blades of grass and leaves. And we don't need an additional transmission tint because the green that we're using for scatter color should be sufficient. The effect is a bit too strong, so we're going to turn down the scatter distance. That looks better. Now that we have that set up, we can go back and apply our texture maps. These have already been prepared. We have grass base color, roughness, and normal. We'll save this. Now let's make two more materials for this model that's similar to this material but with a different color. We can save this material as a child, which will make another material that uses this one as its parent and inherits all of its properties. That way, if we need to make a change later, we can make a change in one place that will affect all of the materials that inherit from this one. Let's call this one grass tile large yellow. Let's change the blend mode to overlay. And now we can adjust the color to the yellow that we want. The back is still green, so we need to change the scatter color as well. Notice that the parent material is grass tile large. This time, instead of saving a child of this one, we'll just save another one. It will still have grass tile large as its parent. This will be a red variation. We'll go here, change the color to red. It's actually more of an orange, but that's okay. 
we'll change this to a red color as well. Maybe a little less red than that. There we go, that looks good. Okay, we'll save this and we're done with the material editor. We can close that now. Now let's go ahead and bring that model into our scene. Create an entity. We'll add a mesh component. Pick that same grass model. Now we can add a material component, which will allow us to override the default material that comes with the model. Before we set the material, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this a couple times. Duplicate once over here. And then this time I'll do Control D on the keyboard to duplicate a third one. Now for each of them, I can assign the material that we want to use. When we come around behind them, the amount of transmission is not quite as much as I'd like. So we can go back to the material editor and fix that in one place and apply that change to all of them. I pushed M on the keyboard and there's the material editor. Now let's open grass tile large because that's the parent of the other two materials and we can change just this one to affect all three. And let's just change the thickness. We'll make it a little bit thinner so the effect will be brighter. When we save this, the change will be automatically applied in the level editor. Next, we would want to go through the same process for all the other grass models that we're going to use. We have several that we're going to use in our scene. The process will be similar for each of these. After that, we can manually duplicate many more instances of these models and move them around the scene to fill out our garden area. Alternatively, you could use the vegetation system to automatically plant the entities over a large area. This is covered in a separate workshop. All right, in this next segment, we're gonna look at making a script that can drive material changes. We'll use script canvas component, and we're gonna see how to look up the right material and look up the right property and apply those changes. In this segment, we'll take a look at how to use a script to drive material settings. We'll use it to make the light from the orb oscillate a bit. First, let's select our monolith, and then we'll add a script canvas component. And we can click here to open Script Canvas. So we initially have a new document open here, but I've already created a script and started adding some notes to it. We'll use that for our starting point. This first group of nodes uses the time value from the tick event every frame to provide a simple modulated value. We expose a cycles per second variable to the component so this can be configured. Next, we have a simple LERP node that will ramp the value between a min intensity and max intensity variable. These are also exposed on the component for configuration. In order to set a property value on a material, we're going to use the set property override float node. By default, this applies to the entity to which the script is attached, which is what we want. It also takes in a material assignment ID. This corresponds to one of the slots on the material component. Let's go back and look at that now. Here in the material component, we see several material slots, one for each submesh. There's one called monolith and one called monolith underscore sphere. We're going to be able to look these up by name, so let's remember the sphere word because that's what we want to search for. We also are going to need to know the name of the property that we're going to edit. Let's click Edit Material Instance to open up the Material Inspector. We're going to want to find the Emissive Intensity property. Emissive Intensity. If we hover over this, the tooltip will show us that the script name is emissive.intensity. 
back to script canvas. So in order to get that material assignment ID for that slot, we can use find material assignment ID. This number indicates which LOD we want. We actually don't want to limit this to a specific LOD, so we can use negative one to mean apply to all of the LODs. Now we'll type in part of the name of the material slot that we're looking for. It doesn't have to be the whole name, it will search for substrings within the slot name. Finally, we need the name of the property that we're going to set. And that should be it. We're going to save this and close script canvas. Now we can assign that script. Let's do half a cycle per second. And the intensity value currently is set to about six. And we'll ramp that down to say five. Now let's control G to enter game mode and see how that looks. I'd say that looks okay for now. We have a script driving a material property. So next we're gonna work on creating a custom material type. We're gonna use enhanced PBR as our starting point. And first, before that, we're gonna take a look at material types in general and how they're set up. And then we'll have a demonstration of how to achieve this, uh, this result. Note that we at Amazon Game Tech are working on an RFC for a Node-Graph-based node shader authoring tool, which should greatly enhance the ability to create custom materials in the future. But for now, we'll show you how to achieve this at a lower level. So here we have the earlier diagram showing an overview of the material system. For this section, we'll focus on enhanced PBR.material type since that's what we're already using for our grass. First, the material type defines a property layout describing all the data that materials of this type can consume and how to display and edit those properties in the material editor. Then we have a list of shaders that render the material across multiple passes. We have a typical depth pre-pass, a shadow map pass, and the forward pass does the main lighting. There are two files involved for each shader. There's an AZSL file and a dot .shader file. AZSL is Adam's custom shading language that's very similar to HLSL. And the dot .shader file links to the HLSL, I'm sorry, links to the AZSL and provides metadata like compilation settings and render states. And there are also other utilities and other shader files that can be included, other AZSL files. Finally, we have material functors, which are small pieces of logic for processing material properties. They may transform the data in some way, then they'll pass the results to the shaders as shader inputs. Adam provides a range of applicability for these files. Some of them are very general and can be used for any material type. And some are for a range of materials that are similar to standard PBR, like enhanced PBR, skin, and multi-layer PBR. And then some, of course, are specific to this particular material type. Here we see an example of how material properties are fed into the shaders. On the right, enhanced PBR common AZSLI is significant because this is where the shader inputs are defined, and this is included in every shader for every pass for this material. In the dot material type file on the left, each property can be connected directly to one of these shader inputs. In this case, we have a property named, named texture map, and that is connected to the input called M underscore base color map that's defined in the common file. Before we get into the demo, I'll also give an overview of the changes that we're gonna be making. So we're gonna duplicate the files from Enhanced PBR and customize them, but we wanna keep duplication to a minimum so that we only copy the parts that are needed. That's gonna help with maintenance and integration in the future. So we're gonna need to modify each of the shaders that have a vertex shader stage. So that includes the depth pass and the shadow map pass, as well as the forward pass. And of course, we also need the common file since that's where all the inputs are defined and we're gonna, be ha we're gonna have to be adding new inputs for configuring the effect of the wind. 
And finally, we're going to duplicate enhanced PBR.material type as animated grass.material type, and we'll update all of the links accordingly. And the final result will look something like this. In this segment, we are creating a custom material type that uses vertex animation to simulate wind blowing through grass. First, let's go find the files that we need to copy. Materials types is where we keep our material types. And here you'll see enhanced PBR. We're going to need the material type file, the underscore common file, the forward pass shader code, and this shader file that references it. So I'll copy those, and then let's put them over in our project folder. So here we are working with Atom Workshop, and we're going to put them under materials, and let's make a new folder called types, and we'll paste them there. Next, we need to get the depth pass shader and the shadow pass shader. So back over to the engine folder. We're going to go back up to assets. The shaders folder includes complete shaders with entry point functions. This is where we'll find our depth and shadow shaders. We'll go into the depth folder and we'll copy these. Control C and paste there and then back up to the Assets folder, Shaders, and the Shadow folder. That's where we'll find our Shadow Map Pass shaders. We'll copy those as well. Next, let's rename all of these to Animated Grass Material Type. In this montage, I'm going through and renaming instances of Enhanced PBR to Animated Grass. We've got to update the shader file references, update the places where the .shader files reference the .azsl files. There are some places in the shader code as well where it's referencing shared .azsli files that provide various utilities. Then I'm going through and updating all of the dot material files for the grass materials that are currently referencing enhanced PBR and changing them to reference the new animated grass material type. So at this point, we can go back to the level editor and it just hot reloaded all of those materials. However, we haven't modified them yet, so they're still exactly the same as what enhanced PBR is doing. So now is the fun part where we get to go and actually change it up to add the vertex animation that we want. We'll start by opening the underscore common file because that's where we define the inputs to our shaders. And we're going to need to add some more inputs for properties that control the behavior of the wind animation. Before I do that, I'm gonna close the editor because while hot reloading is supported for materials and shaders, it does not currently work when you're changing the input layout for a shader resource group. So I've copied the list of inputs that we want, and I'm just gonna paste them here. So I'll go ahead and save this file and let that build. Next, let's open the material type file and add new properties that will connect to these shader inputs. In the material types property layout section, we first have a group section and then we have a property section. Under Groups, we define all of the groups that will be available, and then under Properties, we define each of the properties that exist in each of those groups. We'll start by duplicating the Base Color group and use that to make our Wind group. We'll call this Wind, and the display name is what will be shown in the editor. We'll call this Wind Animation.
Next, we need to add the properties that we want for this property group. We'll go down to right before the base color section. First, I'll copy this texture map property from base color, and we'll use this for the noise texture that's going to drive the wind pattern. We'll call this wind texture. Image is the type of property, and we can specify a connection to a specific shader input. This is what we just added to the shader resource group in the animated grass underscore common ASLI file. This is the one we want right here, so we'll paste that over here. Next, we'll make a scale property for adjusting the size of that texture. Again, we'll copy the name of the shader input from the common AZSLI file. For the other five properties, I'm just going to copy and paste them from another file where I have them already prepared. One thing I forgot is on the wind texture, we can set a default value to a common noise texture because in most cases, this won't really need to be customized. We'll save this file and start the editor back up. Even though our scene is back up and running, we still don't have any animation because we've not added any shader code yet to handle the new properties. So let's take care of that now. As mentioned before, we need to apply the vertex animation in all of our passes, in the forward pass, the depth pass, and the shadow pass. So whatever code we add needs to be in a central location available to all of them. Again, the common file is included in all of those shaders and is a great place to put this function, so let's open that one. I've already copied the new function from off screen and I'll paste it here. There we go. Apply wind is what we'll be using to actually do the vertex animation. We'll save that file, and now we'll open the forward pass AZSL file and modify that to call this new function. Here we are in the vertex shader entry point. This is where we can call apply wind. Here's the world position, and here's the transform matrix, which we'll factor out. So let's save that. I'll also need to make similar changes to the vertex shader for the depth pass and the shadow pass, but that's not shown in this video for brevity. Let's switch back over to the main editor and see where we're at. Okay, so we definitely have some movement going on now, but it's not what we want, obviously. It's too wild. So let's go into the material editor and see if we can tune these properties to get something more reasonable. So the way that we have these materials set up, all of the grass materials ultimately inherit from a common parent. And at the root, we have this grass base dot material. So we'll start here and see if we can get something that works for all of the materials that inherit from it. Let's switch over to the grass model that we set up in a prior session. And that looks pretty good. I'm going to save that. Let's see how that looks over in the level. And there we go. We're all set. We now have vertex animation on our grass. So that about covers the key steps that we wanted to go over, the steps that were necessary to create this scene. There's, of course, a lot more to the Atom render that we can't cover here, but we hope this overview is giving you some insight into some of the common workflows. There are a lot of other talks this week about the Atom Render that I encourage you to attend. Here are a few that I wanted to highlight. 
Um, right after this, there's gonna be an Adam deep dive, which should be interesting to go a bit more behind the scenes of what's going on under the hood. In this demo, we planted the grass manually, but there is a system for planting it procedurally, and they'll talk about that in, in the uh, terrain and vegetation demo coming up. Popcorn Effects is here talking about their particle system, and then tomorrow, there's a talk on shader and, and material modularity, which goes a bit deeper into how we've structured our shader code for PBR materials. And then Johnny's gonna be back talking about look development some more. There's also a talk about the JSON serialization system, which is what a lot of our assets are built on top of, the .material file, .material type file, and similar. Those all use the JSON serialization system. And then there's also an intro into the render pipeline interface, which is the foundation layer that all of the render features like PBR rendering are built on top of. There are more as well that are, aren't included here, so be sure to check the schedule and see what's, what's coming up. And then here's some ideas of where you can get involved. Of course, try it out. See if you can reproduce some of these, these techniques on your own. We've got our Discord names up here and also a link to the SIG, SIG Graphics Audio. So feel free to reach out on Discord to ask questions or provide feedback or, or other, other thoughts you might wanna share. Um, there's also a link to the SIG on GitHub. So feel free to join the SIG, join the community, participate in the conversation there. We'd love to hear more use cases, provide feedback, and even consider jumping in and um, collaborating on some feature development. So that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all attending.